So we had a great <laughs> observing session on Saturday night. The skies were crystal clear. And while you were looking up at the heavens, you may have noticed that not all stars are the same colour. You know, we can see lots of variation. In particular, you know, the most obvious colours to notice are when stars are very red, also when they're very blue. But I think also Capella stands out quite distinctly as a particularly yellowy star. So that was in this part of the sky in Auriga. And then, of course, with Orion that was over there, we've got Betelgeuse and Rigel, and they're very contrasting colours. And I've got Orion there up on the screen, not quite lost in sort of the haze as it is at the minute because it's so low in the sky. But why are stars different colours? And it's nothing to do with their composition because by and large, all stars are made of exactly the same materials. There are very, very small variations with something called metals. Now, in astronomy, we have a very bland periodic table because we have hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, and everything else is a metal. So magnesium, carbon, iron, absolutely everything else we classify as a metal. So if you ever see that written down, that's what it's referring to. And stars are about 75% hydrogen, about 25% helium, and then you have one, maybe 2%, you know, subtracted from that three quarters, one quarter split, which are these heavier elements, these metals. And that's reflective of the interstellar medium from which these stars form. So later generations of stars, our sun is a third generation star. So it formed from gas and dust that was, has been enriched by two previous generations of stars. And stars produce these heavier elements, these metals, during their lives and their deaths. So when they explode as supernovae, if they're massive stars at the end of their lives, they kind of dump all of these heavy elements back into the interstellar medium. They make them in this massive explosion and then they kind of get all mixed in with the stuff that's in between the stars. And then also for lower mass stars like the sun, they will produce lots of carbon and oxygen, things like that. And again, as they die, they put all of this material back out into the interstellar medium. So stars are wonderful recycling machines. So third generation stars like the sun, they've got, you know, this 2% of heavier elements. The previous generation will have fewer of these heavier elements because there was only one previous generation in order to enrich the gas and the dust. And then the first generation, they don't have any of these heavier elements. And that's how we'll know they're the very first stars. So when the James Webb Space Telescope is looking at these first stars and galaxies, that's how we'll know because they will be completely lacking in these heavier elements. So the reason that stars have different colours, it boils down to two things, really. It's surface temperature and then also evolutionary stage. So we talked about this yesterday in the James Webb Space Telescope tour, in case anyone missed it. Stars emit light right across the electromagnetic spectrum. So it's not just light that we can see with our eyes. They also emit infrared light. They emit radio waves, ultraviolet. But they emit light as a black body. And black bodies are very interesting objects. Lots of things can be approximated as a black body. And the key point of a black body is that they, their peak wavelength of emission is entirely dictated by their temperature. It doesn't matter what they're made of. And so it goes the same as when you're heating up a bar of metal. You start with your bar of metal, you know, it is what it is. And as you slowly start heating it, you'll see it glowing red hot. So it's warmer, but not as hot as it can get. Then as you continue heating it, and it gets hotter, suddenly it starts glowing yellow. That's because it's warmer. And then as you heat it again, it'll end up glowing white hot. And if we have a look at the rainbow here that we've got on the plot that's behind the metal bar, you can see that as we're going to warmer temperatures, so we start off in the red glowing at longer wavelengths. As we heat up our bar and it's going up towards the yellow, we're going to shorter wavelengths and then we peak then at the white. And this is why stars are different colours. Hotter stars appear blue. Middling stars like the sun, sort of yellowy, or like Capella, they're sort of yellowy. And then the cooler stars are the red. Are red. And this is, you know, reflecting their black body 
as they're cooler, they're peaking most of their emission at longer and longer wavelengths. And that's why they're the different colors. And you can see that here on the plot. So for example, the sun is at about 6,000 degrees. So that's the big peak here, the top one. And then a cooler star is a thousand degrees cooler. You can see the peak wavelength is in the red part of the spectrum. And so, and so it goes like that. And by and large, that is why different stars, different colors because of their surface temperature. But why would they be different temperatures? That's the key question. Why do they have different temperatures, which gives them then the different colors? And that all comes down to mass and the eternal battle the stars are raging against gravity. Because stars exist their entire lives in this battle against gravity. Gravity is always trying to compress them down, trying to squeeze them down into nothing. And of course, the stars don't want this. They want to exist forever. And so to battle gravity, they fuse hydrogen into helium in their cores. And this process releases energy in the form of photons. And that light pressure, that radiation pressure acts outwards against the gravity, which is trying to compress them. Now, of course, more massive stars, they have greater gravitational forces, which they're trying to battle. And so that means that they have to burn through their fuel more ferociously in order to combat these greater gravitational forces. And in order to do so, in order to have more fusion reactions, producing more energy so that they can fight the greater inward force, they have to burn hotter. And that is why more massive stars are blue and the smaller stars are cooler. So you can see here, going back to these different stars here, if we have a look at Rigel, so that's a second in on the top line, you know, it's very, very blue. It's a very, very massive star, about 18 suns worth. Deneb, the same, it appears very blue, so that's at the bottom, second one in from the right. Again, 19 suns, it's very massive, so it's burning very, very hot in order to battle these greater gravitational forces. And then if we look at Capella, you remember on the sky, Capella is quite yellowy. So again, it's cooler. It's got a lower mass. It doesn't have to battle as great gravitational forces. And so it can burn a little bit cooler. However, if we have a look at Betelgeuse, now we would expect Betelgeuse to have a much lower mass because it's red, therefore it's cooler. So we would be expecting it to have a lower mass, but actually, Betelgeuse is a pretty massive star. It's about 11 suns worth. And this is where that second factor is coming in. We talked about temperature being one factor, but evolutionary stage is another reason. So, so far we've been talking about a temperature mass relation in that lower mass stars are cooler, the higher mass stars are hotter. And this is true while they're on what's called the main sequence and they're fusing that hydrogen into helium to produce energy to battle that gravity. But this breaks down for evolved stars. So when they run out of that hydrogen fuel in their cores and they have to start doing something else to stop them collapsing against gravity. And this is where Betelgeuse is sitting. And hydrogen fusion in their cores will happen for millions, even billions of years. Our sun, you know, will last for its total lifespan about eight, nine billion years or so. But eventually stars do run out of their hydrogen fuel in their core, so they can't do this fusion anymore to keep battling the gravity. And so they have to move on to the next process. And that is then fusing the, the helium that they've produced in their cores to make more energy. So this process, the helium fusion instead of the hydrogen fusion is more energetic. It produces more energy. And so there's more energy pushing outwards for the same gravitational force. That causes the star to swell up. And as they swell up, just like when you expand any kind of gas, it cools down. And so this is why these giant stars appear red, because they have expanded and they have cooled. So it's cooling down because you know, as with any gas, as you expand it, the energy has got more surface area now to escape over. And so the energy can escape more readily. And so the star then cools down because it's losing this energy 
very, very rapidly. And this is an infrared picture of Beetlejuice, which I've kind of fiddled with the levels of it, which I was hoping it was going to come up on the screen okay, and I think it has. And this is an infrared picture of Beetlejuice. So Beetlejuice is this bright spot right in the middle. And you can see where this star has been puffing up over millions and millions of years. And when these stars are big and puffed up and they're cool, their outer atmosphere is very tenuously attached to them now. And complicated processes in their cores from conflicting fuel sources cause them to pulsate and they puff off layers of material. And you can physically see this with Betelgeuse. So if you can see sort of in the middle to the left, there are these arcs around Betelgeuse. That's where over millions of years, it's slowly been losing these outer layers where it's all puffed up and they've been slowly moving away from the star. And as they do so, they cool down and they form my favorite thing in the entire universe, which is dust. Cosmic dust, <laughs> yeah. Bit of dust. How big would Beetlejuice have been when it was in the main sequence? So, as in the size of it? Yeah, would it be similar to the sun or...? So, it would be bigger than the sun because it's, it's more massive, but so at the minute it's extended out to, well, it's debated yeah, somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. But when it was in its main sequence it would have been similar to the sun? Yeah, it wouldn't have, so it wouldn't have been like the size up to Mercury's radius, it would have been bigger. I'm not sure how much bigger, but not, not so much bigger than the sun. Reasonably big, because you know, it, it's 11 times the mass, but not this enormous puffed up giant that it is now. So yeah, good question. And this cosmic dust, oh, sorry, go on. Silly question. Why isn't a star that's hotter than the sun, yeah. cooler than something like Rydal, why isn't it green? I'm going to come to that. I'm coming to that. So yeah, very good question and I'm going to come to it. Um, so we've got this cosmic dust that's produced by these puffed up evolved stars like Betelgeuse and that itself can also affect the colours of stars because the longer wavelength red light that can pass through the cosmic dust uh, it pretty easily it's not impeded so much by it but any bluer light that might have been produced by Betelgeuse that is scattered away by these cosmic dust rays it's exactly why we have red sunsets because during the day the sun is up in the sky above your head and all of the the light can pass through while the sky looks blue and then as the sun sets and it's passing through all of this dust that's sort of low on the horizon we get the blue light scattered away and that red light can come towards us and hit us. And that's why the sunsets and sunrises are red. But this can also impact the colours. So Betelgeuse has this kind of double whammy of it being an expanded, cooler, evolved star, but it's also got all this cosmic dust, which then does an added reddening effect. So to come back to your question of why are there no green stars? So if we've got a star that's sort of peaking where it would be, um, you know, its temperature dictates it's peaking at sort of the green part of the visible rainbow of the spectrum, at that particular temperature, so we're emitting at that particular wavelength, it's also emitting an awful lot of light right across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So, you know, it's emitting lots of orange light and yellow light and also quite a bit of blue. And what happens is just all of those colours merge and blend together. And so then it appears white. And that's why there are no green stars, because we can't just pick up that green colour. There's so much light, all the other colours, that they just all merge and it appears white. Yes. Is that the same for the eye when it's dark adapted? as it is for the camera, because they've got two very different sensitivity curves versus wavelength. Yeah, so it's just, yeah, you won't be able to pick up green stars in your camera either. It will, they will always appear white. No matter, it, no matter what the sensitivity curve, the camera, the eye, it's always white. Never. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, if you had a green filter, then, then it would it would look green. But yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's a camera 
or if it's your eye, those colours, because it's emitting so much light to all of the other wavelengths as well, they just all blend together into white light. The green, the green wavelength is still there, it's just... It's still there, you know, it's, it's just... It's just swamped by everything else. Right? Yeah, everything else is just all mixed in, so that's why there's no green stars. And then also, I've been asked before, why are there no purple stars? Because there are, they always appear blue. And it's just evolution means that our eyes are not very good at picking up purple light, so anything that might appear purple actually looks blue to our eyes because our eyes are, are better at detecting it and that is why stars are different colors hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah red shift and blue shift have an effect so, so is no, a red star a red star or is it a yellow star that's been red shifted yeah, it's a good question. So I don't think stars are moving quick enough towards us to sort of be blue shifted or moving quick enough away from us to be red shifted because they're sort of contained within our galaxy. But yeah, I mean, if they were, then yeah, that could be another factor that we'd have to consider. Please, please.